explore page. I'm not going on Facebook, scrolling through people's uh, posts I don't know about. I'm being very careful because I know the enemy is looking for another way to get in if he can't get in through the main door. So for many of you, you're too strong. The devil's not going to get in through the main door. So he's looking for a side door. He's looking to climb in through a back window. And it's essential if we're going to talk dream interpretation or dreams this, you can't have dream interpretation if you don't dream, okay? And so maybe the enemy's stealing your dream. So we need to talk about that. Now, some of you say, well, the devil wouldn't do that. But is this not what he did in Genesis? He lied about what God said to rob them of the blessing of being obedient to God. So of course the devil's gonna try to come and steal our dreams. If God is speaking in our dreams and the devil wants us to question and violate God's word, the devil's gonna try to come in so that we don't hear God's word, we don't obey God's word, because remember, the blessed life is a result of obeying God. And if you don't know what God is saying to you, you're gonna have a hard time obeying him. And it's hard to know what God is saying if the devil's coming in, come on, is this good type one? to rob you of your dreams. Now, robbers always come at night to break in and steal. 90 plus percent of robberies or home break-ins happen at nighttime. Most robbers are not gonna come in during the day because they'll be detected. So they use the cover of darkness to attack. The devil also uses the cover of darkness. And so we need to be ready we need to be able to overcome the enemy and we need to break this today. There's different ways that we can hear his voice. I think that dreams are one of the first places you start to hear the voice of God. He puts you to sleep and comes and gives you symbols that you can understand and he's telling you messages. Don't just, don't say it's just a dream. It could be a dream from God if you'll look at the symbols and find out what he's saying. Secondly, you could hear whispers, still small voices. People could come with you with the, with the, with the voice of God through a, a, a prophecy. It can happen in so many ways because God is talking all the time. And as a father, he wants you to hear his voice. Well, God bless all of you. This is Prophet Charlie Champ. And this week we are going to be discussing a powerful vision that I had where the Lord came to me and gave me a royal robe and a signet ring upon my hand, gave me a specific word for the body of Christ. As you know, we are in the year of greater works and greater glory. We're stepping through that door. We're ascending the hill of the Lord. We're not going back. Our past has been shut and we're walking through into a new day. Now, we want to discuss this prophetic word, this powerful visitation of the Lord in December of last year. In the vision, God presented to me a signet ring and a royal robe. He spoke to me these words, I am speaking to you now with love and purpose. In this season, I am releasing a fresh anointing for my body to take their rightful place as kings and priests. I have bestowed upon them a signet ring and a royal robe, symbols of authority and identity, to walk in the fullness of my spirit on the earth. The signet ring represents the authority I have entrusted to them. For I am raising up a generation of royal rulers, hallelujah, who will walk in power and dominion of my kingdom. Some of you need to type in right now as a point of contact, I will be a royal ruler. Today's episode is going to be talking about dreams and visions, so I hope you find it helpful. A sister in Christ wanted to talk about this, and I thought this would be a good topic to cover in one entire episode. So we're going to be diving into that today, taking a little look at Joel 2.28, and discussing why visions and dreams are focused on so much, even including the interpretation of dreams within the NAR movement. Hope you find this helpful today. Let's dive in. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. Well, thanks for joining me today on this episode of the Love Sick Scribe podcast. I have a special guest with me today. This is Dwight, Dwight Schrute. So I never smile if I can help it. Showing one's teeth is a submission signal in primates. Once someone smiles at me, all I see is a chimpanzee begging for its life. Y'all can meet him. We have another cat named Jim Halpert. And He's around here somewhere, but Dwight is the more social of the two, though Jim is warming up a little bit. At any rate, thanks for joining me today. 
I wanted to dive into this question that a sister in Christ had sent to me, and I think it will be helpful, and I thought it would be a good episode to talk about in its entirety rather than just answer it in the Q&A from last week. If you missed the Q&A, please feel free to go back and watch that from last week, and I hope you find it helpful. And I want to plan on doing that um, routinely so that way I can try to answer some of your ladies' questions in hopes that it will help provide some clarity to you. Maybe you're coming out of this movement and to also guide you back to scripture. And I'm hoping that you're getting in a biblically sound church where you can ask your pastor questions, ask your elders questions so that you can grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This question from my sister in Christ that I'm uh, doing a Bible study with, and uh, we are also friends, good friends that we've grown in the past couple of years. She had this really good question I thought would be good to talk about today. So why are so many visions accepted in NAR churches without apparent scriptural verification? And one of the things she mentioned was Joel chapter 2, verse 28. So I'm going to point you to some references today for that. And as always, encourage you to go back to scripture and to some commentaries, to maybe go into logos, to look at some of the meanings of the words, really do some in-depth Bible study on this if you're interested in looking into this and talk about and share some resources with you, some video clips from two different um, resources I found when I was looking at this to tell us the importance of dreams and visions. Should we be seeking these things today? Are they normal in the life of a born again believer? What are we to do with these things? Does God still speak through dreams and visions or could he do that today? So we're gonna talk about that. And again, hope you find this helpful today. Now I did share some clips at the beginning that you saw, as always, I do that to try to set the groundwork for what we're gonna be talking about. So I shared with Isaiah Saldivar and he was talking about dream interpretation in his video. And to be fair, he did say that the interpretation belongs to God, referencing Joseph and Daniel. At the same time, I found this particular clip that he said interesting because he was talking about uh, how the devil can come into your dreams and that if you have the devil coming in, if you're opening up doors basically, or if he can't get to you in other ways, then he'll get to you through your dreams, that you need to safeguard that because if you have the devil interfering, then you're not going to be able to hear what God is saying to you. And I find that really sad in the way that it's a focus on you having a personal experience and that God is just unable to speak to you because the devil in his sovereignty, even though Isaiah doesn't say that again, in all fairness, but it is promoting this sovereignty of Satan, which does not exist. So when we're talking about dreams and visions, just in case you want some clarity, when you look in scripture, there were people who were sleeping and were having dreams in the night when they were asleep versus visions that were coming to people when they were awake. Now, sometimes these are referred to in the prophetic movement, for example, as an internal vision, which is something you're seeing in your mind, kind of like a movie playing. That's what the way I was taught about this. And then people that have open visions, that they're in front of your very eyes and that you're seeing them as if they're taking place live in front of you. And we see examples of dreams and visions in scripture. Uh, there's an article that I actually wrote a couple years ago for Christianity.com. And I'm going to put the link for it down below in the description so you can read it, but they do a question and answer format. And so the question that I had was um, about dreams and visions and, and answering that question caused me to go into scripture to look and see what was going on. And so I go into more detail about that, about Daniel, about Joseph and others who had dreams and that most certainly that the interpretation was from the Lord and how those were significant and even pagan kings and things that had dreams and that they required interpretation. But also too, focusing on the fact that this was not normal in the life of a born again believer. This is not a normal thing that's supposed to take place. And we'll get into that more as I refer you to some sources again, I found online. But we heard Isaiah Saldivar. So he's saying, if you uh, allow the devil in that there's, you're gonna limit the ability for God to be able to speak to you and then you can't obey God. Well, there's a problem with that because we know that we obey God through his very word that he's given to us. And he's revealed that through his son, Jesus Christ. Now we know in Hebrews one that it says long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke through his prophets to reveal certain things. And so God in the Old Testament did speak uh, pretty commonly through dreams and visions and, and different elements that he used. But we know now that he has revealed all that he needs to through his son, Jesus Christ. So. That's the first one with Isaiah Saldivar. And then I found that short from Lou Engel. And he is talking about the importance of hearing the voice of God on having these dreams, having these visions. 
And then Charlie Shamp is a Christian mystic, and I've talked about him before, but he is talking about a vision that he had. He frequently has visions and prophetic words that he releases, and so he's talking about this, a vision that he received of getting a robe with a signet ring, and like I said, you can find many things that he talks about, and he he wants to confirm that he has been accurate in his prophetic readings and his um, in his words that he said. But the question is, is the gospel really being presented? So his understanding of the gospel, again, would be the full gospel of miracle signs and wonders. And just a quick thought on that before we look more into a couple more examples, and then we look to see what scripture has to say on the matter and even some commentaries that may help us a little bit in this understanding. And some things uh, as far as what God would do today, could he speak through dreams and such? I want to offer this to you. I was listening to a Bible study from Steve Lawson this morning, and this thought has crossed my mind before, but he was talking about John 6 and about false disciples. And in John 6, in case you need a, um, to refresh your memory, this is right after Jesus feeds the 5,000, which in if you look in reference, if you take in men, women, and children, there were 20,000 in attendance. And Steve Lawson is talking about this in his short uh, Bible study or commentary called Steadfast Hope, which if you haven't checked that out, it's great. He has a more a thorough one that's called the Bible study. I highly recommend it to you ladies so that way you can have something that is a good Bible study resource and will help you understanding the scripture more. But he talks about John 6 and hearing about the false disciples and they had just witnessed the feeding of the 5,000. They had witnessed this miraculous thing take place, but the multitude were not following Jesus because of who he was as the Messiah and recognizing that he's the one that gives eternal life. And he made that clear in John 6, even more clear to the point that many of his disciples quit following him because the word was such a difficult one to take in. But these people were following Jesus and they had witnessed signs and wonders and miracles already. So that makes you wonder, are signs and wonders really part of the gospel? Is, is that necessary? Because you had people in the time of Jesus that saw miracle signs and wonders, including the Pharisees. They saw these things take place and they still rejected Christ. So just some food for thought on the whole full gospel thing of you need signs and wonders in order for the gospel to be preached versus Christ and him crucified is sufficient enough for people to understand because the word of God is powerful enough, uh, power of God unto salvation. For all who would believe. Anyway, back to the subject at hand. So we're talking about dreams and visions. We're going to look at a couple more examples today that I came across, and uh, one of them is from Jennifer LeClaire. So let's take a look at what she said um, in some of the things, because she, she teaches extensively on dreams and visions, how to interpret your dreams. We're going to look at another about interpreting your dreams, and I know that I'm incorporating both. Uh, my friend that asked about this was talking more so about visions, but dreams and visions go along with this because you hear a lot of this in the New Apostolic Reformation. There is a huge emphasis and focus on relying on dreams and visions all the time. And if people are not having these things, then they will use that as the barometer if they really have a good relationship, a true intimate relationship with God. And I guess the question you could ask is, is that really the standard by which we gauge to see if we have a relationship with God? something to chew on and think about. But let's hear what Jennifer LeClaire has to say about dreams and interpreting them and the significance of them. All the time, and sometimes I can see them look at me like, yeah, right. Well, if you don't believe it, you ain't gonna receive it, right? But so sometimes God will speak to us in our dreams to get our attention in a way that's undeniable because we won't listen any other way. And when we go on these treasure hunts, we can, we can, we can, turn up revelations that, that convince us it could only be God speaking. He'll use it sometimes as confirmation. I had a, another baby dream. I have a lot, have had a lot of baby dreams. That's why I have so many ministries and so many facets because I've birthed all these things over the last 20 something years. But I had another baby dream and in this dream, I too was not happy. And I was, I was there, I was working, I was very pregnant and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Again, all right, in the dream, and I was not happy, and and I had to change my desk. I had to, you know, get a different chair. I had to change the the, the size of the desk. I had to change all the all these changes I was having to make again. I'm like, what's wrong with my diet? He's like, you have to change your diet. He said, I want you to eat eggs with pepperoni on them. <laughs> this is my dream. Yes. I want you to eat eggs, and I said, that doesn't sound healthy. Why would I eat that? eggs with pepperoni. He's like, no, you have to eat eggs with pepperoni every day. 
that's what you need right now. And I'm like, okay. So I woke up from the dream and I could not shake that part, eggs with pepperoni. I said, what does that mean? I don't like pepperoni. Uh, I couldn't figure it out. And so I shared my dream with a friend and I'm like, this is the craziest dream. I'm pregnant. I know that God's going to burst something. I understand he's doing something new. I understand there's going to be a lot of change. I got all that. But I said, one part of this dream makes no sense to me. The Lord told me in the dream, the Lord showed me I needed to eat eggs with pepperoni. She goes, oh, wow, that's awesome. She says, I grew up and my mom made eggs with pepperoni every week. Is, is that she needed, my friend I told the dream to, she needed to bear witness to the rest of the message of the Lord in the dream about the new thing, the birthing and the changes I was going to have to make in the ministry to accommodate what God wanted to do. She needed to buy in to what the message of the Lord was through the dream. So God tucked this little detail in the dream that meant nothing to me, but meant everything from her. So she believed all the whole rest of the dream because of the pepperoni and the eggs. Mm, pepperoni and eggs. Yeah. So um, that was her describing about it, interpreting a dream. And she's talked about, like I said, dreams a lot. She'll talk about what it means with teeth falling out in your dream and, and lots of things about dream interpretation. We'll look at another example here in just a minute. And then I have one example of someone who's well known that had a vision very quick. And then we'll get into some more understanding and just look at the text for a minute and listen to a couple of resources I think will be helpful on the matter. Because like I said, this is a good question. Um, this is something that's really focused on in this movement. And you can see that Jennifer's focusing on it. And even she's using this woman validating her dream about eggs and pepperoni to say, oh, well, you know, it was confirmation. And the woman, did you hear what she said about the woman had to buy into the dream? It was kind of weird how she was wording it. I don't know if anybody else felt that way, <laughs> but it was weird how she was wording it. And, and she was using this conversation with this woman that she knew that could relate to scrambled eggs and pepperoni as confirmation that this was from God and her being pregnant in the dream and that this was a symbol of, of birthing another ministry. And like I said, that's the thing is that people will, instead of going to scripture as their final authority or even testing what they had, what you'll find is there's not a lot of testing that's going on in this movement. To be frank with you, and, and I spent many years in this movement, um, I did have dreams. I was not an avid dreamer, but when I did dream, they were very vivid dreams. They were very memorable. I talked about some of those last week about what happened to me a week or so prior to us coming to the terms of what we did and then finally exiting the movement. So if you want to listen to that, you're, you're welcome to listen to that. But there is a huge focus on this. And what you'll find is, is that they'll say, well, you can test the dream. Well, the problem is many people don't test the dreams. They get a dream and they believe it's either from God or if it's something bad, they'll say, well, it has to be demonic. If there's things in the dream and you'll hear something here in just a minute. Um, I was listening to another video and looking at a teaching and the dream interpretation just happened to pop up in this in this video, and so I, I'm going to play it, but you'll hear some of these interpretations for dreams. And there is this emphasis on experiential parts of someone's professing faith, experiences of dreams and visions, hearing the voice of God, so many different things that, which that's lumped into hearing the voice of God as dreams and visions, which that's lumped into hearing the voice of God, dreams and visions. But people will focus on experiential things in their life, and that is what they'll use as the foundation for their faith in Christ. And we get into dangerous territory with that because then we start basing our experiences as the truth. And when we don't go back to Scripture as the final authority and the, the foundation upon which we rest, and we say, it doesn't matter if I never have another dream again or if I have another supernatural experience again, my foundation rests on my faith in Christ to save me. And that's all that I need. And that's sufficient for me. Then we're in a far better place than someone who's constantly resting on their experiences in order to validate their walk with God. So I hope I'm, I'm providing some clarity on that because sadly there will be people that will base their walk with Christ on their supernatural experiences, on dreams and visions and things. And that's not a sure foundation. 
Your foundation is in Christ and his word that testifies of him. You came to saving faith. For those who are in Christ, you came to saving faith because you heard the gospel. You heard the written word being proclaimed as rhema, as the spoken word of God. You were hearing the voice of the shepherd calling out to you through the effectual call of the gospel. So you need to put your trust in that if it's not already. Um, and it's okay that if you've never had a dream or a vision or anything like that, that you believe that God was talking to you, that's not what marks you as a Christian anyway. And so the quest other question would be, well, for those who say, well, I do have dreams and I believe that God is speaking to me. Again, I'm going to share some sources for you at the end, I think will be helpful. But let me share this clip with you real quick. This is a clip from Alexander Pagani, and he is talking to his church about demons in your mouth that was the name of the sermon that he was preaching but that's not the focus today maybe we'll talk about that another time but the focus today he started launching into dream interpretation let's see what he had to say about that us looking for demonic information to get names he wants us to depend on the holy spirit to be able to give us revelation the greatest levels of revelation and spiritual breakthroughs is when you analyze and observe the animal kingdom you don't believe so you want to confront laziness in your life? God doesn't say go to Pagani and cast out a demon of laziness. He says go and observe an ant. You missed that revelation of what I just said. God said you sluggard, look at the ant. Which means when you look at the ant, you get revelation and you get breakthrough. Did you catch it? See? This is the reason why when God speaks to you in dreams, how many of you guys have been speaking to you in dreams? Watch this. And if you get bit by a dog in your dream, that means that there's going to be a friend who's going to backstab you. You're not ready for that. You ready? See? The Bible said a dog is what's a man? Man's best friend. So if you're having dogs bite you, it means someone close to you is about to backstab you. Why didn't God just show you the person? But he showed you a dog. Why? Because we wrestle not against We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So God is not going to show you your friend backstabbing you. But he's going to show you an alligator. How many of you ever had a dream with an alligator? But what does that mean? It means that someone around you who has authority, who has a big mouth and twists things. And sometimes it's somebody that's either a matriarch or a patriarch in our family. Most of the time when you dream of the crocodile, it's grandmama that got a big mouth. It's auntie that got a big mouth that causes division in your family. Why doesn't God just show you the person? You wanna know why? Because God is not against people. He loves your gossiping uncle. He hates the demon though. When God wants to show you different ranks of demons, why don't he just show you the demon? No, he'll show you different types of rats and roaches. So your dream with mice, that's lower ranking demons, imp demons. But when he shows you a rat, that's a higher ranking demon. If he shows you a white rat, that's a religious higher ranking demon. This is how God operates. God is saying, God is saying, I want to take you beyond Jezebel. Jezebel is, is level one. We got to move beyond Leviathan. We got to move beyond Ahab. We got to move beyond witchcraft. There is another group of demons that God is saying, I want to reveal it. And all I need is my church to become zoologists. If you would take time to study a tiger and realize a tiger is still a feline, but a tiger travels solitary and a lion travels in packs. So when you see a tiger, it's not the same as a lion. Because a lion means a network of demons. A tiger will mean one higher ranking spirit that has it in for you. Did you catch it? My God, my God. That's what the Bible says. That when people gossip, the Bible says the poison of asps is on their tongue. Which means they have the venom of a poisonous snake on their tongue. The Bible says that a person that sows seeds of discord lays cockatrice eggs. The book of Job chapter 37 talks about an ostrich. Why would God talk to us about a bird? Because an ostrich in the text means an ostrich. But God says if you follow her behavior. You will see that my people love to live in denial, putting their head in the sand. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever asked Pagani this, but where is he getting his interpretation for these things in the dreams? 
where is he getting the interpretation that an alligator represents someone around you with a big mouth? Where is he getting the interpretation or the understanding that someone that's dreaming about a white rat is affiliated with a religious spirit or that mice are lower ranking demons and rats are higher ranking demons? I mean, I hope that you can understand the, the questions that are coming from this because again, there is this focus and if he's going to claim that, that God is giving him this revelation, then what if someone else comes along and writes, I don't know, like a dream interpretation dictionary called the divinity code that I talked about before in another podcast, the descriptions down below for that one, it was about uh, prophetic dreams and a trip to the new age section and how I noticed and observed that the new age and the occult have dream dictionaries just like the prophetic movement does in the in the new apostolic reformation i used to have a dream dictionary that allegedly told you the meaning of things in dreams is that divine revelation are we to put that on par with scripture because god does not speak unauthoritatively so where is he getting the understanding for these dreams as far as mice and rats and lower ranking demons and higher ranking demons and if you have uh, the fact that God uses examples of, of the ostrich and or the poison of asps, which is a metaphorical type talk in scripture. It's not to point you to the fact that you're supposed to be like those or you're acting like those animals in a way, but those things are in there to help provide an imagery to us so that we can have a better understanding what God is saying in the context of scripture. So... These are things that we need to think about. And, and you'll see, as what he was saying and others, huge emphasis, as what my sister in Christ was pointing out. There is a huge emphasis on dreams and visions in this movement, but yet they're not scrutinized. So who's, who's calling him to question? Who's calling him to the carpet and saying, um, excuse me, where are you getting that understanding for that? Instead, it's just accepted. And if you hear these people that are believed to be apostles and prophets and they're speaking from platforms, and if they start giving this revelation, then it's accepted. It's never called into question or scrutinized. And if it is, then that person has a religious spirit or they have some sort of demonic entity that's working against the anointing. So you're not allowed to question these things. That's not a good place either. Now, I have one more example and then we'll move on and I'm going to share some some helpful sources with you. But this one is from Sean Bowles. Now, some of you all may be familiar with Sean Bowles. Um, I've heard some people call him the Google prophet because he seems to use his cell phone when he's when he's prophesying to people, almost as if he's getting the information not from God. But anyway, he had a recent vision that he wanted to share. And so let me play a little bit of that for you right now. Well, I had a vision and the winds of change are blowing. What does that mean? In the Bible, there were seasons, just like we have seasons in the natural, there were seasons many times where there was change for the people of God. In Israel, there was change for the Jews who start Christianity and there would be a, a huge momentum of things that would happen out of that change. And I believe we're in a season again, when I saw this vision, I saw the vision of winds carrying keys and they were landing on people just like you and I. And these keys were all about key things that were going to change in your life, your perspective, your identity. And many of you have been going through some of the greatest internal changes. So you can see great external changes that you could not have partnered to or had the fruit of if you hadn't done the work inside. So to my friends out there who've done the inner healing, who've done the, the counseling, who've done the work inside the discipleship, it's going to pay off so big in this next season. Wait. God's gonna give you opportunity to really catch up in those areas. But I believe we're about to hit a time like the parable of the 10 virgins where five had the oil, which represented they had a connection to their relationship with God, to themselves. They understood their purpose. They had oil in their lamps, which represented their intimacy and their purpose to God. And then there was five who had just been living life. So a vision of the winds of changing are blowing and keys are on the winds. And uh, if you listen to the video through and he has some little plugins from different movie clips and such for humor and for effect, he also seems to be giving more advice or more encouragement to people that have had inner healing, which I don't promote inner healing, or doing these other things to, br to bring change into your life. It doesn't sound like a prophetic word. 
And it's very vague and generalized. And that's the other thing, too, is that you'll see in this movement, is that you'll see a lot of these vague, generalized words that seem recycled or um, reused, you know. And you got to ask, when we see visions and dreams in Scripture, they were detailed, they were specific, um, and if they didn't have the meaning to them, God provided the meaning. It was not ambiguous. That's the other thing with dream interpretation, too, is that you'll see ambiguity with it or the visions. Well, I had this vision. I had visions. <laughs> I had dreams of different things. Many of you all that are watching this probably did if, if within this movement and New Age and other things. But again, your experiences do not mark you as a Christian. It's Christ. It's Christ's finished work on the cross that marks you as a Christian. But the ambiguity in this movement when interpreting these things is all over the place. Uh, well, it could be this or it could be that. And same thing when I was trying to interpret some things in my own life. And it's a huge distraction. It's a huge distraction. And it distracts you away from the word of God. It distracts you away from truly growing in your fellowship with God. When, when you're constantly chasing these things and pursuing them and you're believing that that is what um, identifies or marks you having true intimacy with God. Now, for those that would ask, well, I've had dreams and I've, or I've had this vision, or I know people that were, there's stories of people in the outermost parts of the world that the gospel is not available to them. And they are testifying, uh, Muslims testifying of dreams and, and Jesus coming to them or that they come to saving faith in Christ through a dream or vision or something is revealed to you and then it takes place and you believe it's from God because you, you said that you've taken it back to scripture, which scripture should be your final authority. And someone could make the argument too, you know, if your dream agrees with scripture, then why do you need it? You know, someone can make the argument for that. But anyway, your question may be that you're having these things and that they have maybe brought you closer to Christ as your um, testimony or that you believe they're from God and that they helped you in some way. What do we do with these things? Is this normative? Is this supposed to be a normative practice in the life of a Christian? I want to play this for you real quick, and I'll put the link to this video below in the description as well. It's from gotquestions.org. They address the question of dreams and visions. Does God still give dreams and visions? They talk about in this video the definitions of them, so I'll, I'll skip that and we'll go to the end where they address the issue of people that are claiming to have these visions and dreams and that they don't rule out the possibility of these things happening, but they want to keep things in a biblical perspective. Have a listen to this and hopefully this will help you. If God desires to communicate his message to a person, he can use whatever means he finds necessary, a missionary, an angel, a vision, or a dream. Of course, God also has the ability to give visions in areas where the gospel message is already readily available. There is no limit to what God can do. At the same time, we must be careful when it comes to visions and the interpretation of visions. We must keep in mind that the Bible is finished, and it tells us everything we need to know. The key truth is that if God were to give a vision, it would agree completely with what He has already revealed in His Word. Visions should never be given equal or greater authority than the Word of God. God's Word is our ultimate authority for Christian faith and practice. If you believe you have had a vision and feel that perhaps God gave it to you, prayerfully examine the Word of God and make sure your vision is in agreement with Scripture. Then prayerfully consider what God would have you do in response to the vision. God would not give a vision to a person and then keep the meaning of the vision hidden. In Scripture, whenever a person asked God for the meaning of a vision, God made sure it was explained to the person. There's one other clip I want to play for you right now. It's from a YouTube channel, Smart Christian Channel by Corey Miner. He actually did a video about a year ago when I was looking and doing some research on this. I found this video that he did. I think it's about 12 minutes long. I'm not going to play the full video here. But I'm going to play a little clip for you. What's nice is that Corey also does some uh, Greek work when he does some of his videos. So he can take you through some of these words and tell you what they mean and, and how they're used and the context of them. But just listen to what he has to say about dreams and visions and how we should treat them today as believers and what we are to do with them and how we are to view them in light of Scripture. I think you'll also find this very helpful. 
does God still use those dreams? Well, there's no way to know. People will say so, and the Bible does not say or give any indication that that will ever stop, or if that will stop, when it will stop, the Bible does not say. Now, could it be that uh, it stopped once we receive his written word? It could be because the purpose of these dreams and these visions were to obviously to inform and to let us know about what God is doing. Well, certainly we have that. Now, some people are going to abuse this. Let's say for the sake of argument that these dreams and visions are still around. And even let's say that women can have them as well. The fact of the matter is people are going to want to abuse these gifts. People are going to want to say the Lord showed me this. The Lord showed me that. And how do we know if we are? Uh, going along with the with the idea that people still have dreams and visions. Uh, and does God lead people in their dreams and in these visions and so forth? Does God? I do believe that God still leads people, but specifically with this particular spiritual movement in these dreams and visions. If he does, how are we to know that these that this is actually from God? Because there's a warning if, in fact, these visions and dreams are still at play. He, let's start in 13, as a matter of fact. For such men, speaking about false apostles or folks that may come to them with this deceptive, um, these this deceiving doctrines and so forth, these false teachings, says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And look what he says here. And no wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond with their deeds. His point is that there are some people who will come uh, and will have some sort of satanic or demonic influence upon them and will speak to them. And so just like us, we can also, if if this gift is still working, if this movement is still in play, uh, then you got to be careful that what you might be receiving or hearing or being led by or from or to is not some work of the enemy. But we're told by John in 1 John 4, 1, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so you want to be careful that if you feel like you are receiving some sort of dream or vision from God, that you that you test it. Well, how do we test it? Well, we need to test it by the scriptures. If what you feel like you're being led by, and again, I'm not sure that these that this movement is still even in play, but if a person believes so, well, then all we have to do is take the word of God and use it. Now, what about when someone says that they are being moved by the Lord? They feel like they've been moved by the Lord, um, but this movement uh, cannot be verified by scripture. For example, someone says they're being led by the Lord to go and take this particular job. Well, how do we find that out in the scripture? Well, this is where your maturity in the Lord comes from. What you want to do, uh, we I believe that God can still lead people. Now, the closer you get to him, the more that you understand how he leads uh, and that he's not always speaking to you, telling you, hey, turn right, turn left, uh, buy this kind of coffee, eat this hamburger today. That's not what God is after. And so uh, you'll, you'll kind of recognize, remember, God doesn't change. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so everything that he's going to do and how he's going to lead, if God is truly giving a, giving a person a vision, uh, if he's leading, uh, in all likelihood, it has to do with him being glorified, not with you getting the best deal, um, the best package on something that you want to buy. Uh, no, that's not, that's not how God moves. Are you with me? God is not giving dreams and visions in order for you to glorify yourself, in order for you to enrich yourself. God would do so as he's always done in order that he might be glorified. And so you have to ask yourself this question. If you still believe that dreams and visions are still happening and that you have received dreams and visions, well, if they did not glorify God, well, that's one surefire way to understand that that was not a dream or vision. And therein lies a problem. Oftentimes we see people saying they had these dreams and visions and they're only to glorify or to edify themselves, to build themselves up or to say, the Lord told me this about you. Well, how is that glorifying God? And nine times out of 10, oftentimes it's not. It's to glorify some person. And so I would be careful. I, I'm not sure that, that God still moves this way. I could be wrong, though. I could be wrong. But if he does, we've got ways to verify this. If it doesn't, we've got ways to verify it. 
bottom line is the surefire way that we do know how he's moved, how he's spoken to us is by his word. And so if things don't line up with his word and aren't keeping in his character and they don't glorify him, then we know for a fact that's not a dream or a vision that came from God. We know exactly who it came from. Amen. Now, the last part of the question that my friend and sister in Christ asked dealt with Joel 2.28, which we also see this in the book of Acts in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And Peter is referencing some of what is happening in Joel 2. And in fact, he's referencing Joel 2.28 through 32. But Joel 2.28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And it goes on in verse 30 to talk more about the great and uh, wonderful day of the Lord, showing signs and uh, wonders in the sky and when the Lord comes. And so I would encourage you to read Joel 2, 28 and look at that. But I wanted to share with you a couple of thoughts on this as far as some commentaries that I came across. When I look at this on Logos, I wanted to read this to you. This is out of a commentary, critical and explanatory on the whole Bible. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, in this commentary on the book of Joel, under the dreams and visions, this is what it had to say. The dreams are attributed to the old men as more in accordance with their years. Visions to the young men as adapted to their more lively minds. The three modes whereby God revealed his will under the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, Prophecy, dreams, and visions are here made the symbol of the full manifestation of himself to all his people, not only in miraculous gifts to some, but by his indwelling spirit to all in the New Testament. They cite in this commentary, John chapter 14, verse 21 and 23, and John chapter 15, verse 15. In Acts 16, 9 and 18, 9, the term used is vision, though in the night, not a dream. No other dream is mentioned in the New Testament save those given to Joseph in the very beginning of the New Testament, before the full gospel had come, and to the wife of Pilate, a Gentile, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, Matthew 2, 13, and Matthew 27, 19. Prophesying in the New Testament is applied to all speaking under the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit and not merely to foretelling events. All true Christians are priests and ministers of our God, Isaiah 61, 6, and have the Spirit, Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. Besides this, probably a special gift of prophecy and miracle working is to be given at or before Messiah's coming again. So I just wanted to uh, read that for those that had questions about that. Another commentary I have right here in print is the Moody Bible Commentary. From Peter's perspective, the gift of the Spirit fulfilled the promise of Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Though debatable, it seems best to interpret the day of Pentecost as only a partial fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, an already not yet kind of fulfillment. The division between the already and not yet comes between verse 18 and 19. The gift of the Spirit marked the beginning of the Holy Spirit's work, but not the complete fulfillment of the events at the day of the Lord. It goes on to say in this commentary, Peter anticipated the fulfillment of all of God's promises to Israel when Christ returns from heaven. Another possibility is to recognize that Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 32 predicts the Holy Spirit's work in the events of the future tribulation period, while Acts 2 14 through 21 merely applies them to the Spirit's work. The application would be that just as many unusual signs would follow the Holy Spirit's powerful work at the end of days, so here at the birth of the church, the unusual and demonstrative work of the Spirit was evident in the apostles speaking in tongues. So hopefully that provides a little bit more information as well. And there are some varying views as to uh, the, the dreams and visions, although it's interesting that there's such a focus on that when Peter goes on to preach the gospel after that. He's going, going on to prophesy or proclaim the gospel. He is forthtelling the gospel. And 3,000 souls came to saving faith in Christ that day because of the proclamation of the gospel, not because of dreams and visions but because of the gospel. So I hope that that provides some uh, information or better understanding to where you can kind of understand what those verses are saying based on some other Bible scholars and their commentaries on that. You can always do a further study on that if you like. But I think one of the main things to understand for those of us who have come out 
of the New Apostolic Reformation movement is that our lives are not supposed to be focused on the next spiritual encounter. We're not supposed to be chasing dreams and visions. We don't need to have these in order to validate our walk with Christ. We are to trust in God's finished work of Christ on the cross. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel, that is the full gospel. Him dying for our sins in accordance with scripture, his burial, and his resurrection in accordance with scripture. This is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. And this is the assurance that we have of our hope. Our hope is in the full gospel, his death, burial, and resurrection. And we don't need to have supernatural experiences to validate our walk with Christ. Yes, there has been a supernatural, miraculous thing that has happened to you and I for those who are in Christ. And that's that we've been raised from the dead. We have been brought to spiritual life because of what Christ did. And when we heard the gospel, we came out of spiritual death and into life. And for those that have the question of these encounters or these experiences, Scripture has to be the final authority on these things. It has to be the final authority. And above all, anything that's happening, as what you've already heard before from, from Corey Minor, for example, everything that happens should be glorifying Christ. If it's pointing back to us and it's pointing back to our super spirituality or it's pointing back to our ability to hear the voice of God or to have these radical encounters that we're claiming, but Christ is not exalted and there's no fruit that's in our life to demonstrate that we're truly growing in spiritual maturity. And spiritual maturity does not mean that you have more dreams and visions, but what scripture declares and outlines as spiritual maturity, such as the fruit of the spirit and the things that we are to do in honoring and glorifying Christ. If those experiences are not drawing us closer to Christ and that we're not being conformed to his image in the way that the Bible teaches and instructs, then we're in danger of following something that is actually leading us away from Christ. And so I hope that this has been helpful. As always, it's not exhaustive, but it gives you some insight and maybe just to urge you, again, go back to the Word of God. Go back to Scripture. That's the point of me doing these podcasts and this entire work that I'm doing on this is that I want to utilize the time that God has given me and thank Him for pulling me out of this movement and to help as many women as I possibly can to snatch them out of this deceptive teaching and to point them back to the truth of God's word and to his glorious gospel. Because there is such majesty and beauty and splendor in the word of God. And that should be sufficient for us. And it is. So thanks for joining me today. I look forward to being with you again as we cover another topic. And until that time, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.